We have a solar storm that almost failed to launch, a sliver of fast solar wind, and some new regions are growing quickly on the sun's far side. Those stories and more are in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.com dot edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week remains at mild to moderate levels. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, we do have quite a few active regions in Earth view, but there really isn't a heck of a lot of activity. Sadly, we have a lot of different filaments that are erupting, but they're not really Earth-directed or they're failing to launch. A perfect example is back on the 30th. You can see this gorgeous filament here. It looked like it was going to give us a dazzling display as it launched right there. But believe it or not, as we pull up a close view. You can see this filament as it begins to launch here. Watch part of it lift off, but then as it goes, look at all this material that kind of just slinks back here and just stays right there. So this filament, believe it or not, the bulk of this is still kind of hanging on. And when we looked at it in chronographs, it was like, meh, not much to see here. So that's kind of the story right now with the sun. We haven't been getting all that much activity. Now we do have, let me rotate it back just a little so you can see we do have this coronal hole, if you can call this a coronal hole. It's, believe it or not, this is transequatorial, but it's very small. It's pretty much a sliver, and it's not going to be sending us all that much fast wind, but we might see that here starting around the 4th. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but it really isn't going to last all that long. What we've been hoping for is to get a little bit more activity from these regions here, especially this cluster, but it just hasn't been manifesting. We have been watching fast growth from region 4167. You can see it here and also 4155 and 4153, they're actually continuing to grow on the sun's far side, and we'll talk about that more when we get into stereo's uh, view, but not really, really big flares. We've just been seeing kind of low-level noise. There's a lot of noise on the dayside radio bands, and that's because we have all of these regions. We will have a few more regions rotate into Earth view, and I'll talk about that more when we go into the far side, but believe it or not, Everything's kind of staying at the moderate to mild level, and it's likely going to continue to stay like that over the next few days. Now, as we switch to our far-sided sun, of course, this is Stereo A imagery. We're able to use Stereo A imagery because Stereo is now looking a bit to the side of the, of the sun compared to Earth. So you can see here's Earth, here's the sun, and here's Stereo A looking at the sun kind of on the west limb of the sun. So it sees a little bit beyond where we're able to see right now. And so you could, just to calibrate you, here's region 40. 4167, 4155, and 4153. They're the ones that we've been watching quite closely. We did just have a big eruption off of, you can see it right there, off of Stereo's West Limb. That was a nice uh, display in coronagraphs, but again, not Earth-directed. But you can see, as you watch, we've got a couple new regions here that Stereo is moving out of Stereo's view, but you can also see, look at all this growth in region 4167 and all this activity down here. It's also 4153 is firing solar storms. So we are going to continue to watch these regions as they continue to rotate through the, the far side of the sun because who knows, maybe in about 10 days we'll start seeing some decent activity again. So now to get a picture of what's going on on the full sun, we actually put together a full sun map. And many of you have asked me, how in the world do I do this? Well, in this case, I'm actually having to use imagery from three separate spacecraft. In fact, you can see here, this is the Earth-facing disk right now. Uh, in SDO imagery, this is SDO AIA, so it's all in red, and you can actually see the delineation, the east and the west limb here. So this is what we see from Earth. But as we look at the far side of the sun, I'm actually using two different uh, spacecraft images. Images. 
This is from Solar Orbiter. This is the EUI instrument. And then we also have a sliver here from Stereo A. This is EUVI imagery. So put them all together and we can actually take a look at the entire sun. In fact, if we look at our orbit circle here, you can see here's Earth, here's Stereo A, which I showed last segment. But then you also can see Solar Orbiter all the way on the other side. So it is right now staring at the sun from the sun's far side. So we like to take advantage of these opportunities when we get them. And this is how I can put it all together. So as I put this in motion, I'm going to try to stand completely out of the way because there's so much going on. I want you to pay attention to region 4165. You're seeing this is the region that is actually now rotated into Earth view on the east limb of the, of the, Earth, of, of the sun, but it is a new region. You can see it growing. So you can watch it grow here as it approaches the, the east limb. But that's not the only story. We also have some new regions that start growing in here and a little bit on the sun's far side in Stereo A's view. So those will come up as new. I want you to take a look at those because those are regions that we're definitely going to be following on the far side uh, as they continue to grow. This one's not too big, but look at these two new regions. They are growing incredibly fast. So if that's the case, this could become a very, uh, you know, very active cluster. They have a tendency to have a bit of synergy when they're so close together like that. So it's going to be in about 10 days or so. It's going to be a very interesting uh, state that we find ourselves in. Right now, we're also watching 4166 and 4143. These two regions are going to be rotating back into Earth view here really within the next couple days. So uh, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, we're going to be watching region 4165. You can see it growing here. It's a little bit bigger than it was when we saw it on the sun's far side. So we're watching that one to see if it becomes a big flare player. Also, this cluster here that's going to rotate into Earth view in about two or three days. And then in about 10 days, we've got yet our next set of new regions that will be rotating into Earth view. So we could be seeing some big flares picking up in about, you know, anywhere between three days to about 10 days from now. So enjoy the calm while you have it because things may change pretty soon. And now switching to our current conditions with our global geochron map, we first take a look at our Ovation Auroral Power because Aurora really hasn't been all that exciting over the past week. In fact, most intensification occurred late on August 1st, and that means that people in, in the Northern Hemisphere got a little bit of stuff. In fact, we do see that we've got a little bit of a twilight in the Northern Hemisphere coming back. So perhaps some of you folks managed to get at high latitudes, a little bit of aurora show. However, with that moon getting brighter by the day, it's likely going to drown out any aurora you see. So might have to wait a few days until we get some fast solar wind. But now as we switch to our roti, this is our scintillation risk uh, for higher frequencies like GPS and GNSS. This is a risk level. You can see that we haven't been getting as much in the high latitudes, and that's because we really haven't had much auroral scintillation. But you might notice in the mid latitudes, you're getting a lot of especially clustered around uh, storm areas. And also in the northern hemisphere, you're seeing a lot near that dawn dust transition. So you aviators, especially if you are flying uh, in, in these high latitude areas where you're getting a lot of that, you're kind of hovering right around that twilight in that gray line, you might notice a bit more scintillation, especially uh, if you're flying around the night side. So uh, be aware of that because uh, scintillation risk continues to be a bit of an issue. Now, as we switch to our DRAP radio blackout and uh, polar cap threat meter, you can see we actually are getting a little bit of pops here and there from very small uh, flares. It's really not causing much of an issue for HF and, and VHF radio, uh, but expect maybe a little bit of noise here and there. Most of the frequency uh, degradation is below 15 megahertz, so it shouldn't be too much of a problem for VHF, but you HF Skywave uh, operators, you might notice a bit more noise on those dayside radio bands, but no huge risk for radio blackouts as of yet, but that could change again, like I said, in about three days. Now, switching to our moon, we are passing through the first quarter phase on our way to a full moon, with a full moon being on the ninth. So you night sky watchers, well, you may not be able to catch a uh, comet uh, 3i Atlas anymore because we've got this bright companion. You're going to have to wait for it to go back to a new moon. But if you turn your telescopes towards Saturn, you'll get a unique conjunction where you can actually watch Titan's shadow pass across the planet. 
And now switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating that sliver of uh, fast solar wind from that tiny coronal hole that's rotating in through the Earth strike zone here over the next couple days. Uh, where NOAA's expecting maybe active conditions at high latitudes with maybe about a 25% chance of a minor storm. Probably not going to be all that great, especially as that moon gets super bright. So maybe be on aurora watch from the 5th through the 6th, but by the 7th, things should be pretty much calming down. Now, at mid-latitudes, well, we're only expecting unsettled conditions, but we do, again, have that wind watch on the 5th. Uh, NOAA's giving us about a 15% chance of active conditions on the 5th, and I'm going to extend that into the 6th because it's kind of hard to tell when these, you know, when you have a thin sliver of fast wind coming, it's kind of hard to tell exactly when it's going to hit. But easily by the 7th, things once again will be calmed down, and we're just going to have to wait uh, for better aurora chances later. Now, switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we are sitting in the mid 140s for solar flux right now. This is also about moderate noise on the dayside radio bands because we do have quite a few active regions in Earth view and they are firing some small flares, but that noise level sure is high. NOAA is giving us about a 35% chance of M class flares at the R1 to R2 level and even about a 5% chance of X class flares at the R3 level. This is likely going to quiet down to about minor noise right around the 6th or so as some of these bigger regions rotate to the sun's far side. But we do have those new regions that are rotating into Earth view, so likely all of that is going to pick back up starting around the 7th and then into next week as well. And now switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week. We are, everything is in the green this week. We are sitting at the D1 normal range. This is at flight level 360 for you aviators. It's also the S0 quiet range for everyone else. We are sitting literally at a 1% risk for S1 to S2 level radiation storms, which means basically no risk at all. So you frequent flyers, and this does include air crew and you high risk passengers, you are all in the clear this week. So enjoy. So the space weather this week remains pretty much at the mild level. Now we do have some fast solar wind that will be hitting Earth right around the 6th, maybe the 5th. It's kind of hard to tell, but it's going to be one of those two days. Not expecting a lot from it, but aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you could get a bit of a show. Aurora photographers at mid-latitudes probably sit this one out, especially with that bright moon. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, we do have a lot of noise on the dayside radio bands, but we sure don't have a lot of big risk for radio blackouts right now. Strangely enough, it's just our sun just seems to be kind of stuck. It's just not actually firing off any any big storms or anything else right now. So just enjoy that quiet because in about three days, things could start getting a bit noisier. And then by about 10 days, we should have some a lot more activity on the disk. And now uh, you GPS users, well, things are looking pretty good for you. They don't have a lot of activity on the night side, so we're not expecting a lot of issues with Aurora. We are having a little bit of that scintillation risk. So as long as you stay clear of those Dawn Dust Terminators and clear of Aurora and stay vigilant, your GPS reception should be pretty good. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.